evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Luke AME Church, located in Opelika, Alabama. Welcome to our inspirational Bible study with Pastor Monique Summers. We are doing 52 weeks of Bible study, normally on Tuesday nights, but we had to reschedule the Bible study for this week for tonight, which is Wednesday. April 17th. So we greet you tonight with the joy of the Lord. And we're delighted that you have decided to join us for our inspirational Bible study. We are using as a guide for this study, a book that is written by Max Licato, a New York, New York Times bestselling author. The book is entitled, They Walk with God. Max introduces us to 40 biblical characters who inspire us. And that is exactly what we hope will happen as we continue to go through this book together, looking at the different biblical characters that he recommends and having a discussion and study on their qualities and their characteristics. I would like to preference, though, that this is not an exhaustive study, meaning that the biblical characters that we discuss and study we're not doing an exhaustive study on that particular character, but we're teaching principles or teaching a point that we hope, again, would inspire us in our walk with the Lord. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this study. The Heavenly Father, God, we come before you tonight with open hearts and with open minds. We thank you for allowing us to assemble ourselves together, whether on this Zoom call or those who may be watching by way of social media. We just ask the Heavenly Father that you will continue to be with us throughout this study by way of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. And so we invite him in to have his own way. And God, we know that your word serves a purpose. You said that it will go out and it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you sent it to do. And so we avail ourselves tonight to your word. We know that it is still a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We give you honor, we give you praise, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Tonight, we want to look at our biblical characters being Mary and Martha. Uh, this Mary and Martha that we're referencing is are the sisters of Lazarus. Mary, um, name from an Egyptian verb that means to love. And also it could mean to be rebellious or a verb mean to be bitter or strong. And Martha uh, means lady or, or mistress of the house. I got these definitions from a resource that you see there on the screen. Um, www.adarim-publication.com meaning for Mary and it is the same for Martha. And so if you want to do further research search or study, I recommend going to this site to get a more in-depth um, etymology of their names and other um, information that is on that site. So tonight we do want to look at Mary and Martha for a brief moment. And then we're going to dive into an area of study that I think will be beneficial to all of us. So the icebreaker on tonight is a question. Um, well, it's a statement that I would like to ask. Um, define the word servant. How would you define the word servant? And I sort of put a definition there as one who serves others. And for those of you with a biblical background, Christians that may be on the call, um, who were the servants in the Bible? So anyone want to go a little broader with that definition for the word servant? And if so, I um, need yeah. lines to speak. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Reverend Summers, I think a servant is one who gives of themselves for the sake of others, for the good of others to the benefit of others. Um, so for me, that is what a servant is. One who gives of themselves, one who serves mm -hmm. others in whatever capacity that God um, has given 
us the measure to serve with. I agree mm -hmm. with that. When we, uh, anyone else care to broaden that definition or to personalize it? What is your definition of the word servant? If not, uh, anyone care to share uh, of anyone that you can think of in the Bible who were servants, persons in the Bible? Are, are servants just uh, disciples uh, in the Bible? Were the only servants in the Bible just disciples? Who were the servants in the Bible? Well, the uh, greatest example of servant in the Bible was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. The Messiah. Any other servants who served others? I submit to us, and maybe at the end I can even cross reference some scriptures. Um, prophets, um, they were servants in the Bible. Uh, of course, the Messiah, Jesus, as uh, Julia has just mentioned. Um, one who stands out to me is Moses. Um, Christians, when the Bible referenced Christians in the Bible, they are defined as servants. Um, and so, and then um, there's one other uh, mentioned in Revelation 22 and 3, um, glorified saints were servants uh, mentioned in the Bible. But we're going to sort of curve our thoughts and, and center this lesson tonight, once we get through our scripture reading uh, on servanthood, and we want to sort of look at what does service to God look like and what are some of the rewards for serving God. And so let's dive into the study. So as we do, we want to read um, John chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. I believe what I'm about to read is the amplified version of this particular text. And it reads thusly. Six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom he had raised from the dead. So they gave a supper for him. There, Martha was serving and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. When then Mary took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was going to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? And the money given to the poor. Now he said this, not because he cared about the poor, for he had never cared about them, but because he was a thief. And since he had the money box serving as a treasurer for the 12 disciples, he used to pilfer what was put in, into it. In other words, he used to take from it still. So Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep the rest of it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. A large crowd of Jews learned that he was there at Bethany, and they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest planned to kill Lazarus also, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away from the teaching and traditions of the Jewish leaders and believing in Jesus, following him as Savior and Messiah. And so we find here in the text just a, a brief summary. Um, last week, we looked at Jesus uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. And in this chapter here, which follows chapter 11, where last week we considered Lazarus, this week we're looking at his sisters, Mary and Martha. Max, the author of the book that we're using as a study, recommended that we read this particular scripture and focus our attention primarily on verses two and three, which I'll read again. 
So they, uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, gave a supper for Jesus. And Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table. And then Mary took a pound of uh, very expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And, and it was uh, fill the house with the fragrance of the perfume. And so tonight, I want us to look at, uh, Max does also in, in the reading, have us to look at all three and actually four of the persons mentioned in this particular text. We, he, he considers Martha, he considers Mary, and uh, calls her the worshiper. Martha, who was busy serving, uh, and Lazarus, um, who was reclining at the table, but we later learn of him as we read on down in the scriptures, verses 9 through 11, that the Jews wanted to kill him as well because Jesus had raised him from the dead and the people were following, becoming followers of Christ based off of, no doubt, Lazarus' testimony uh, and others testifying, no doubt, about him. And so Max goes through uh, a, a synopsis of telling us what this uh, lesson is about. And then he began to pose questions regarding um, worship and service. And he basically tells us that Martha need to remember that worship is service. And Mary need to remember that service is worship, that they are uh, interchangeable. And so on tonight, as I begin to just look at the particular text and read it and just to meditate on it, what God stirred in my spirit, in, in, in fact, is where we're going to push this lesson to, is to look at um, the definition of what uh, it means to be a servant, which we've just looked at that, and then look at the requirements for service to God and what are some of the rewards for that. When we consider Mary and Martha, two sisters, two different gifts, um, all gifts are needed in the body of Christ. We need those with that serving heart and that servant men, uh, mentality. We need those who want to worship and, and be um, in the presence of God, but we can't always be serving and we can't always be at that moment of vowed and at the feet of Christ. we got to worship and serve and we do it um uh as the opportunity avails itself and then we consider also uh, looking at um their brother who was reclining there at the table no doubt with jesus but what a powerful testimony that uh, lazarus has and all of us have testimonies of how god has resurrected us but to die and to actually come back to life and and god has raised him is just a powerful testimony. And then we don't want to leave out uh, Judas Iscariot. He's mentioned also in this particular text, but who wants to be the person who is um, the deceiver, the one who will betray Jesus, the one who steals uh, money from the treasury. And so as we look at uh, the lesson on tonight, we, we want to shift gears a little bit and consider um, what it means to serve the Lord. But before we do that, I, I cross-reference another scripture, Luke 10, 38 through 42, where uh, Max suggests in the reading of the lesson, and I will say also that uh, this text deals with when Jesus once again was in the presence of Mary and Martha, and one was very busy uh, getting everything together uh, to serve and, and one was worshiping Mary was at his feet and she says to Jesus don't you in other words Lord don't you care she's not doing her part to help me and Jesus tells her Martha Martha you're worried and bothered and anxious about so many things but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part that which is to her advantage which will not be taken away from her and what was she doing the Bible says there in verse 38, now while they were on their way, Jesus entered the village called Bethany and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister uh, named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was continually listening to his teaching. 
while she was very busy and distracted with all of the serving responsibilities. And she approached Jesus and, and said, look, I'm, I'm doing all this work alone. And, and Christ immediately tells her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about the wrong thing. Serving is necessary, but worship is too. And, and, be, and learning, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching. And it teaches us in a cross-reference kind of way that we need to be able to do both and know when to do it. When should we pull away from that busy bodiness of keeping everything flowing which we need to have someone getting things in order to steal away so that we can teach so he suggests to us by the time we get over into john and see jesus and mary and martha's presence again that uh, martha had learned her lesson about worship you don't hear her complaining in the text that we referenced on tonight about her sister mary anointing jesus feet and worship in a moment of worship uh, because no doubt she had learned that significance uh, that uh, it's okay to worship God and, and to um, still away as her sister Mary had done. But we need people who can do both. And in our lives, we need to be both able to serve and worship the Lord. And so are there any comments or questions um, so far on the scriptures that we have read or any insight that anyone want to share before we go into the gut of the study. If not, um, the question here, um, it asks us to read um, Romans 12, uh, four through eight and answer two questions. What does the passage teach us, uh, teach us about unity and diversity? And what does it teach us about the relationship of the two and that comes from uh, Romans 12 4 through 8 and it reads thusly and I start at verse 3 for by the grace of God given to me I say to every one of you not to think of yourself more highly and of um, more important than uh, than other people than you ought to think but to think so as to have a sound judgment as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service for just as in one physical body we have many parts and these parts do not all have the same function or special use so we who are many are never the nevertheless just one body in Christ and individually we are parts of another mutually dependent on each other and since we have these gifts that differ according to the grace given to us each of us is to use them accordingly if someone has the gift of prophecy, then prophesy. Uh, let him speak a new message from God to his people in proportion to his faith uh, possessed. If it's service in the act of serving, or if he teaches in the act of teaching, or he who encourages in the act of encouragement, and he who gives with generosity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy and caring for others with cheerfulness. And so this particular the scripture here uh, sort of breaks down about the body of Christ is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We're all part of the body of Christ, but each one of us have a uniqueness and we bring diversity into the kingdom of God, which is needed on all levels. And so he asked the question, um, what does this passage uh, teach us about unity and diversity? We see Martha has one gift and Mary has another. One's a worshiper, one's uh, have a servant uh, attitude, outlook on life. Um, and so it, this scripture breaks down and shows us is is many of us that make up the body of Christ. Uh, we're unified in that it's one body, but there's a diversity of gifts. There's many gifts that we each possess. And so what does it teach us about the relationship of the two? We're interdependent on each other. Sometimes I need a word of prophecy. At other times, I may need a word of encouragement. Um, and so, and, and and we don't know who we will come in contact with. And so all of these gifts are necessary. All of these gifts are needed and, 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 and should be used. And we should use them in our service to God and in our worship to God, the gifts that he has given us to give them back to him in whatever shape, form, or fashion that is needed in any given moment. 
So anyone care to share or give any more insight uh, on this particular scripture coming from Romans chapter 12, um, particularly verses four through eight? Any comments, any questions? If not, we'll go uh, to um, what God has given me for this evening. Um, when we look at worship, when we look at service, um, and it may develop into a two-part study, to look at worship and to look at service to God. And so tonight we want to look at the requirements for our service to God, requirements for service to God, keeping in mind that a servant is one who serves others. So what are the requirements for service to God or in God's kingdom is what we want to particularly look at on this evening. And hopefully we'll get to what are the rewards for serving God. The first scripture we want to reference is coming from Psalms chapter two, uh, number two, verse 11. And I put uh, in context here, um, verse 10 through 12, it says, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in God. And so we see here in this particular verse, uh, the psalmist encourages us to serve the Lord with fear. And that fear is not uh, a fear of running away from him, but it, it, it is a reverence. Serve the Lord with reverence. Serve him um, with all. Serve him with all of our heart, not a, a place of fear like we would normally define fear, but it is a reverence for God and rejoice with trembling. We do not find a lot of people anymore who uh, fear the Lord. I can remember uh, growing up and when you would walk past the church ground, people would put out their cigarettes. They wouldn't smoke on the church ground. Uh, they When they rolled by the church house, they would uh, uh, turn their music off and definitely down uh, because of their love for God, their reverence for God. And so when we serve the Lord, we're serving him um, in reverence of him and, and awe of him and love for him. And it causes us to act and work and give of ourselves in a different way. And it will be noticed. So the psalmist here says, serve the Lord. And when we do it, do it with a with a sense of fear, with a sense of reverence for him and rejoice with trembling. Some people, it doesn't even bother them uh, to, to curse on the church ground, uh, not even the church ground. Let's even go further. We are the church. And when people are in our presence, uh, it used to be such a reverence for men and women of God of the cloth and the mothers of the church and the fathers of the church that, but you don't see that kind of fear anymore of God. But service to God requires us to do it with fear that lines us up into a place where we respect God. Almost like you wouldn't do certain things in the presence of your parents um, because of not the fear of them, because you reverence them, you love them and you admonish them. And so you, you, act a certain way in front of them, but we don't want to just act a certain way. We want it to be a, a lifestyle for us. And so one of the requirements for service to God is that we serve him with fear and we rejoice with trembling. Any questions, comments on this particular verse on our service to the Lord, how we serve the Lord with fear. The next scripture that I shed light on is uh, our service to God causes us uh, to uh, walk upright. Psalms 101 verse 6 from uh, Psalm of David says, my eyes shall be on the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He who works deceit 
shall not dwell within my house. He who tell lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off the evildoers from the city of the Lord. And so David writes to us in this particular Psalm, Psalm verse number six, and it says that my eyes shall be on the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. And he who walks in a perfect way, he who walks in an upright way, he shall serve me. You know, a lot of times we feel as if though we can serve God any kind of way. I used as an analogy one time that God wants us to have, you know, clean hands and a pure heart. The Bible said, who can ascend into the holy place? Only he with clean hands and a pure heart. David says here, he who walks in a perfect way, in a righteous way, in an upright way, he shall serve me. We can't serve him any kind of way. I remember uh, when Caleb was a little boy and I was getting ready to leave home. And he asked me, could he go with me? I was leaving. He said, I want to go. I want to go like a kid will do when a person is leaving and, and a parent or a grandparent. And I said, you can't go. And he said, why? I said, because you're not ready. You're not clean. You need to go get a bath. And he wanted to go so bad till he said, but I want to go. I said, you can't. And I was getting ready to go out the door. And he said, Monique. And I looked back. He said, can I go dirty? And I wonder sometimes, and I'll walk with the Lord when we have missed the mark, but sometimes we like uh, King Saul want to still appear as if though we're walking in an upright way when God told him, you know, that obedience was better than sacrifice when he had not done what God told King Saul to do. And when the prophet revealed to him that the kingdom was going to be taken away from him, God told him to kill all the Amalekites and to destroy uh, all of the cattle, but he did not. And when the prophet came, he said, what is that bleeding in my ears? Because they could hear the, the cattle being killed. And he said, oh, I say some of the best. And he said, but God told you to destroy it all. And he, the kingdom was taken away from Saul. And God says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so when uh, the prophet Samuel was getting ready to, to walk away uh, and go, he, uh, Saul begged him when his sin was revealed, go with me before the people one more time. I know I ain't clean. I know I'm not walking in. I haven't walked in a perfect way. I've disobeyed God. Sort of like Caleb said, can I go dirty? Some of us still want to serve, but we want to serve and not in an upright way, not changing our ways. But tonight, God is saying to us, when we offer our service to him, we want to do it in an upright way. We want to walk in that perfect way. Are we perfect? No, but we serve a perfect God. Are we sinless? No, but we ought to sin less often. Now that we've come uh, a believer in Christ and growing in him. And so the scripture says, my eyes is on the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. And he who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. God wants us striving and for perfection, walking in, in, in that upright way. And if we miss the mark or we do wrong and didn't know it was wrong, or even knowingly saying we, we fall down, but the Bible says the, the beauty is we can get back up again fall seven times, eight times, but you get back up again and, and walk in that upright way. That's the person who shall serve God. David wasn't perfect, but God said, he's after my own heart. When his sin was revealed to him, he cried out, creating me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit, wash me with his son. Psalm 51, when you have time, go back and read it. When his sin was revealed to him, he wanted to get clean. And he said, and they clean me up, Lord, creating me a clean heart, renewing me the right spirit. And when I'm back in that rightful place, then I can te teach transgressors the way. I'm like King Saul, who God took the kingdom from, who said, stand with me. Just go back with me before the people. One more time. No repentance of the heart. And so I say to us on tonight, uh, we, we should strive to walk upright as servants of the most high God. Let us not be like Caleb, the little baby boy who said, I want to go so bad, Monique, can I go dirty? And he didn't, and I didn't allow him to, but that was a childlike mentality. 
But those of us who are more seasoned saints, let us strive to walk in that upright, perfect way as God would have us to do. Any comments or question on on, uh, on this particular scripture, point number two, as we look at our service to God? If not, uh, point number three, absolute loyalty. We look at Matthew 6 and 24. Uh, which talks about you cannot serve God and riches. If we're going to serve God, the scripture says no one, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, no one, no body can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the riches of this world. You can't be in love with the world and love and in love with God. Choose ye this day who you will serve. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And so this scripture admonishes us and, and teaches us, and shows us that as servants of God, who is offering our service to God, we got to be in love with him. Love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. No one can serve two masters. Can't serve God and the riches of this world. Either we love him or we don't. Either we're totally committed or we're not. God wants our loyalty. Absolute loyalty. Not anything that's tossed, thrown back and forth like the waves of the sea. Not a double-mindedness. I serve you wholeheartedly here, but over here I will not. I can do this. Remember the young rich ruler? What must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him, keep my commandments. He said, oh, I've done this since my youth. He said, one thing you lacking, go sell all you got and give it to the poor and then pick up the cross. Come on, follow me. The Bible says that young man went away sadly for he had many possessions. Don't let our possessions in, in this world cause us to lose our salvation. Can't serve God and man. Got to love God more than anything else. I think of Father Abraham in the book of Genesis. When God told him, Abraham, take the son you love. Take him up on the mountain. And I want you to sacrifice Isaac there, who names means laughter. Who was the promised child, the child that God had told him would come from his womb and would be the seed. And truly he was. But God needed to know that Abraham loved him more than he loved Isaac. And he took him up on the mountain. And I can't imagine how hard that was for him to bound his son to prepare him as a sacrifice. And at the moment of getting ready to sacrifice his son, the angel hollered out, hollered out Abraham, Abraham, don't you see the ram stuck in the thicket of the bush? And he took that and ram and sacrificed. And so I say to us on tonight, check your loyalty. You say you love God and you're serving him. Make sure we're offering him our absolute loyalty. We're absolutely committed to him. And then uh, Romans 7 and 6 uh, deals with regeneration. Uh, the scripture, I uh, put it in context and read from Romans chapter 7 verses uh, uh, 1 through 6. It says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brother, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. But when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit of death. But now we have been delivered from the law, 
having died to what were held, what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so in this particular scripture here, frees us from our past, not what we used to be. We are now a new creation in Christ Jesus, and we don't have to be bound. Uh, the, the Jews that became believing Jews and followers of Christ had to be able to release themselves from the law, having died to the law and finding new life in Christ, who is now has been raised from the dead so that we can bear fruit. And so regeneration is necessary for us to be servants of the most high God. We got to be born again. We got to be delivered from our old ways of thinking and not bound by anything other than what God has uh, bound us with. And, and we're free in Christ. We're free um, to, to follow him and his ways and his teaching and not to have to give an account to our old life, our old past, that we're, we're redeemed from that. And now, since we've died to what held us in bondage and slave, we're set free now by the Spirit, born again believers, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so I say to us on tonight, um, when we serve God, come to him knowing that you're born again, you're regenerated. Come to this dying world, sharing your testimony of how God delivered you, how God has set you free. The Jews um, were still hung up on the law. Christ said, and I mentioned in the message on Sunday, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to destroy it. I come to fulfill it. And now that the law has been fulfilled, Christ has fulfilled the law. We're no longer bound by it. We walk in this newness of life, learning his ways and becoming more like him and in his image. We don't have to offer sacrifices anymore. The Jews don't have to be under that bondage of the law because God has fulfilled that. The next one that we want to look at on tonight is um, in our service to the Lord is that we want to uh, be people who behave like uh, Christians, our behavior. Uh, Romans 12 and 11 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. That means that's an ongoing, that's present tense. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. And so our service to the Lord causes us to behave like Christians and serve him now that we're this new creation in Christ. Verse 11 said, not lagging in diligence, but we're very diligent about what we do, uh, a fervent spirit, serving the Lord. In present tense, every day we get up serving with a mission to serve the Lord. And how do we do it? And how is that exemplified? How do people know that we're servants of the most high God? It's by our Christian behavior. Doing what is good. Kindness. Showing affection for one another. Giving honor and preference, the scripture says to one another, continuing and always steadfastly in prayer and giving to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, doing it with, with generosity and a kind heart. Serving the Lord requires requirements for serving God. Deals with that behavior of the Christian. How, how, how we behave, what, what does that look like? And then serving God with uh, a sense of humility found in Acts 20 and 19, uh, Paul's writing, serving the Lord with all humility. He said, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, but I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught publicly from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. But I'm going to keep serving the Lord with humility, not with a haughty spirit, but with an humble spirit. I'm going to serve the Lord. Paul said, and on my way, because he said, with well, one scripture, I've learned to be content no matter what. So with tears and, and with many trials and with people plotting against me, I'm still going to serve you with humility. I'm going to do it with a smile, knowing that you're going to betray me. I'm still going to be of service to you. He didn't put Judas out of the 12 and he knew he was going to betray him. But serving the Lord with humility and Christ is our example. I think Julia said it at the beginning when I said, define servant. She said, Jesus is our best example, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, Emmanuel, serving the Lord with all humility. We keep serving. We don't give up. And sometimes we may serve with tears. Sometimes we're serving, Paul said, with tears and trials, serving with people coming against me. I didn't hold nothing back. I didn't give you a half-hearted message. I didn't teach half-heartedly, but I proclaimed it to you from house to house, publicly, teaching and preaching repentance to God. And even though I'm on my way to Jerusalem and, and no, not knowing what will happen there, but he had saw in a vision how he would be bound and, and, and he would be killed, except that the Holy Spirit testifies, he says, in every city. And so when we serve God, Make sure we keep a sense of humility that we exemplify being an humble servant of the Lord. And then the seventh principle that I leave with you on tonight, which is probably one of the most important ones as we serve the Lord, is found in Galatians 5 and 13. But I read in context Galatians 7 through 15. You ran well, Paul writes to the church of Galatians. Who hindered you from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And if I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. You are serving of the Lord. One of the requirements for us to be true servants of God, Paul says, but through love. Serve one another, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. I want to go back to that. He said, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself not backbite, not devour, but love one another. He said, for we have been called to liberty and only do not use that freedom, that liberty as an opportunity for flesh, but through love, we got to learn how to serve one another. We got to learn how to keep serving, as Paul just said, even in trial and tribulation and tears. We got to learn how to keep serving, even when people want to plot against us or bring up our past. We keep serving and love them. People know true love. You know it when someone is genuine and ingenuine, not so genuine with you. Through love, that's how we serve. We don't do it grudgingly and out of necessity. Love in, in, in our giving, love in our teaching, love in our living, how we love one another. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples. You are my servants by the way you love. Check your love. You, If we are servants of the most high God, then we've been called to love one another. And the Bible says, 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's an equality there. Can't love myself no more, no more or better than I love my neighbor. On level playing ground. How many of us esteem the next man just as good as we esteem ourselves? Check your love. Check your love. Because you want to fulfill the law. And love, Paul says, fulfills the law. And it is shown through how we serve one another. And so as we get ready to close, there are four scriptures that I, I put on the screen. Uh, there are rewards for service to God. Yes, we want to serve him. Um, and, and we're known by our service. So a servant is one who serves others. And the requirements for service causes us to fear God. Psalms 211, to walk upright, Psalms 101, verse 6, uh, absolute loyalty, Matthew chapter 6 and 24, uh, a, regener a regenerate life, no longer bound by the law, Romans 7, verse 6, serve uh, that we offer our service to the Lord, Romans 12 and 11. And that we serve with humility, Acts 20 and 19. And that we love, according to Galatians 5 and 13, that exemplifies how uh, the requirements for service to, to the Lord, but the rewards for serving God. There's a divine honor that comes to us found in John 12 and 26. Uh, we are accepted before God. A lot of us serve, people serve man, and they want the praises of man. But Romans 14, 18, if we can receive the acceptance of God, man uh, acceptance naturally will come, especially those who are believers. And rewards for service to God uh, includes an inheritance found in Colossians 3 and 24. And the final one is eternal blessedness found in Revelation 7, 15 and Revelation 22 and 3. And so quickly, I'll share these with you. Um, John 12 and 26 says our service uh, to God, one of the rewards is that we'll get divine honor. What does that honor look like? Uh, verse 26 says, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. A lot of times, we want praises and honor from man. But scripture says here in verse 26, if anyone serves me, and this is Christ teaching us, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be. And if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. So the question to ask tonight is, who would you rather receive honor from? Man or God? Earthly honor or divine honor? Earthly honor will pass away. We ain't got to look very far. We can look at the presidential elections from 2016 to current. Some of the people who started off with some of those who served as president have fallen away. Some have even turned against. No absolute loyalty there. But lips that once praised you can be the same one that can curse you. But Christ says, if you serve me and if you follow me, where I'm at, he's sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty in heaven. There my servant will be. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. I want the father to honor me. When it's all said and done, people say, may the works I've done speak for me. Yes, truly. And then as we serve God in our works, he says, my father will honor you. So one of the rewards for service to God is that God, the Father, will honor you. I'm reminded of when Jesus was baptized and the Bible says, heaven open up and he said, this is my beloved son and who I'm well pleased. And God can look on us and make, the, can God, let's say that, look on us and make that same statement. Acceptance before God is found in 14, uh, Romans 14, 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by, by men. 
accepted before God, honored by God the Father, accepted by God. The scripture says in context, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet, if you your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he, for she, for they who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we were honored by God and then we're accepted by God. And the third one is, what is the third reward? There's an inheritance. It's found here in Colossians 3 and 24, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there's no partiality. So I say to us on tonight, God has a divine honor that he wants to bestow upon his true servants. God has not only divine honor, but uh, he accepts us. Not only does he accept us, he will provide for us an inheritance. And in Revelations uh, chapter 7 and 15 and Revelation 22 and 3, there's an eternal blessedness. So even when this world has dissolved and heaven and earth has passed away and we're in the new heaven, that God says that there is a blessedness that comes with to his servants that serve him. Uh, Revelation 7, 15, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne dwells with them. Can't get any more blessed than that in his presence. And then Revelation Chapter 22 and 3, which deals with the river of life. And John writes, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruit, fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall ser serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. There shall be no more night there. There will be no need for a lamp, uh, nor light for the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is an eternal blessedness that we receive from serving God. So this is our study on tonight. Um, as we get ready to bring it to a close, I yield uh, the floor to see if there are any comments or questions before we prepare to close out. Uh, and I do give you a homework question for you to go back and look at. We discussed it briefly, but read Romans 12, 4 through 8. And I do want you to consider uh, what does this passage teach us about unity and diversity and what does it teach us about the relationship of the two? And think of it in the context of service. How can you offer your service with so many people in the body of Christ who have unique gifts? Um, how do we offer that? So before we close out, comments, questions? If not, let us uh, prepare to close out. Next week's study will be on Mary Magdalene. Uh, we ask that you would read Isaiah 40. Uh, verse 28 through 29. Uh, and we will come back on next Tuesday at 7 p.m. at our regular scheduled time for our next inspirational study. So let us pray to Heavenly Father. God, we thank you on tonight for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. We thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for those who thought it not robbery who called in to join us. We thank you for the listening audience to Heavenly Father uh, that may have joined us by way of social media. We thank you that we have heard your word. We believe that we have been inspired, that we will go forth considering our service to you and realizing that there is a reward for our service to the Lord. Help us, God, to walk closer to thee. We pray for everyone on this call and everyone who will listen to this 
study at a later time. God, you know what we stand in need of. So look at us individually and collectively. And if it be your will, we ask that you provide whatever it is that we are each standing in need of and that we are even in want of. We'll continue to Heavenly Father to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. It is in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus that we do pray and ask these blessings. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Our study on tonight, and we do pray that something has been said that has, in fact, inspired you or will cause you to do like the people of Berean did. They would go back to the word of God and search the scripture to see if what has been said to them is in fact true. So I pray that you will take this lesson and go even deeper and look at your service to the Lord. Be blessed on tonight. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.